Adenoviruses are the cause of the common flu that we get every season. But at the same time, we might have the ability to use them for gene therapies. And what gene therapy is, is delivering some kind of genetic material such as mRNA or DNA to a patient who has a dysfunctional uh, gene that doesn't code for the protein that they'll need for some critical process. And so the idea is, is that hopefully we'll be able to modify and genetically engineer adenoviruses such that we can put in the beneficial genes that a patient would need without harming the host cells and this would cure patients of diseases after a one-time administration. So what I'm going to do in this video is walk through an introduction of the adenovirus and how it works and what are its key features and we're going to go through its modes of action. And so the very first thing to note about the adenovirus is it has double-stranded DNA and this is uh, a key feature because there are several other types of viruses that don't use double-stranded DNA. They'll use other types such as mRNA or circular DNA and so it gets pretty crazy but the adenovirus sticks with double-stranded DNA and in addition to that it carries its own form of DNA polymerase and this uh, sometimes people put a little V here because this is the virus's own unique DNA polymerase. It is a massive protein complex that exists within the capsid of the adenovirus itself. And so what will happen is if we were to look at an adenovirus, and adenoviruses and viruses in general are incredibly small relative to the cell, so this illustration here is not to scale. Uh, viruses are typically about the sizes of ribosomes, and ribosomes would be a tiny speck uh, in this cell, if we're looking at this image right here, but um, for sake of illustrating, what we can see is that on our adenovirus, there is no um, phospholipid bilayer like we see with some other types of viruses such as the HIV virus. Therefore, we call this naked. And naked is just another way of saying that the capsid is exposed. And the capsid is the proteins that make up this kind of outer surface of our uh, virus. And on the other, the other things we're going to see on the outside of the virus are these things that we'll call spikes. And there are more technical terms for the uh, components that make up each spike, but um, for the sake of an introduction, what we're seeing is that when a an adenovirus will infect a host cell these spikes are going to latch onto a receptor on the cell surface. And adenoviruses are specific to epithelial tissues. Sorry. And this is the reason why when you get the flu, you're commonly going to have some kind of respiratory infection, such as your throat's going to be sore, or you're going to have mucus in your lungs. Um, and then it's also common to see uh, problems with your gastrointestinal um, lining because that's also, um, sorry, that's also composed of epithelial tissue. So I'll just leave it at that. Okay, and so what will happen is these spikes will bind to receptors. Specifically, they're going to be called CAR receptors that exist only on epithelial tissues because viruses are incredibly specific. And after this binding event happens, another protein called integrin will work with the CAR receptor or CAR receptor and it's going to perform a process called endocytosis. And endocytosis is a normal function performed by uh, cells in which they're going to wrap the virus or whatever material they want to take into the cell in another phospholipid bilayer. And so if we had our virus right here with its spikes, endocytosis means once it's been accepted and uh, imported into the cell, there's now this phospholipid bilayer, much like the um, phospholipid or plasma membrane that makes up the cell itself. And so at this point, what the cell will do next is fuse this phospholipid bilayer with lysosomes. 
and these lysosomes contain uh, hydrogen peroxides and peroxides that are going to make whatever is inside of that vesicle after they fuse with it very basic. And so these lysosomes, I'll just draw them as another vesicle because that's really all they are, are going to fuse with the um, endosome that contains the virus and they're going to make a bunch of hydroxide ions within the endosome. The consequence of this will be that the pH of that uh, environment will increase. It's going to become a lot more basic. And when the pH of the endosome increases, the spikes on the outside of the uh, virus are going to break off. And now we're just going to have the capsid um, all by itself. And the spikes are going to cause problems within the plasma membrane or the phospholipid bile that makes up the endosome. And that will cause the plasma membrane itself to disintegrate. And so now, I shouldn't draw a circle around it, now all we have is the virus, uh, it's capsid without any spikes, and the next thing that's going to happen is this virus is going to locate something called a microtubule, and these microtubules are essentially railroad tracks throughout the cell. They're used for transport, and there's motor proteins called kinesins and dynins, and dynin motor proteins are going to be walking along these microtubules that look like railroad tracks and they will carry, they will literally walk forward and carry through a series of conformational changes the viral capsid to the nucleus of the infected host cell. And so once the uh, viral capsid has been walked via a dynin protein to the cell membrane, the capsid is going to inject its genetic material, which is going to be a bunch of double-stranded DNA, into the host cell. And in addition to that, the, um, there will be the viral DNA polymerase, and the job of the DNA polymerase, much like the eukaryotic DNA polymerase, is going to be replicating the viral DNA. And so after the genetic material makes its way into the nucleus along with the host genome, it's going to be expressing a bunch of quasi-endonucleases, and their job is going to be to chop up the host genome. And this is order to this is to make the um, DNTPs, the ribo, deoxyribonucleic acids, required to build the viral DNA. And what we'll find is that after 40 hours, one million copies of viral DNA are created. And uh, in addition to that, the capsomeres, capsomeres are the components that make up the parts of the viral capsid are also going to be encoded for because these are nothing more than proteins. So RNA polymerase is going to get involved and you're going to go through the series of steps required for translating the mRNA into proteins. The host's own ribosomes are going to be used to make the viral progeny and these viral capsids and the capsomeres specifically are very uh, interesting because they have an affinity for the viral DNA that gets made and they self-assemble. And what we mean by self-assemble is that they don't require any additional enzymes to do this. They will assemble spontaneously along with the spikes that they use to um, break free of the endosome once they got into the cell. And um, this is how the virus will proliferate and its progeny will spread to additional cells. And so the question here is, okay, after I get infected, how am I going to fight this off? And so the way you fight this off is you have little antibodies. In, the, in biology, they're commonly abbreviated ABs. They're proteins that are shaped like little Ys and they are incredibly small. They're even smaller than ribosomes because these things are going to have these ends that will have a specific affinity towards something. And so these antibodies are going to stick onto these spikes that are on your adenovirus. And when they stick onto the spikes, the virus not only becomes incapable of now binding onto a, uh, onto a host cell, but these antibodies are also going to have some kind of flag on them 
to call a white blood cell over to actually kill whatever they're stuck onto. And uh, you can think of the virus as an antigen because it's generating the antibodies and the immune response. And um, the question to ask is, okay, uh, with the wild type adenovirus, every time it infects a host, what happens is the host will die. And this is a problem because if you're trying to use the adenovirus as a medicine or as a therapy, you don't want to kill your patient. So how are you going to do this? And the answer to that solution is that we're going to have to figure out ways to uh, modify the viral genome to make it so that it doesn't kill the host cell. So we basically need to take out all of the nasty genes that cause it to kill the host genome and uh, create those quasi uh, restriction endonucleases that are chopping up and ruining everything. So um, this is going to wrap things up for an introduction to the adenovirus and gene therapy. Uh, I hope you guys find it useful and thanks for watching.